Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our morning service. You are all very, very welcome this morning. We're going to start our service this morning by singing hymn number 155. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then, where'er you go, we'll stand to sing.
Pastor Furley. Praise the Lord. Let's bow our heads in prayer. We're going to come before the Lord and remembering those that are sick and pray for them that God will minister to them in Jesus' name. We continue to pray for Darren McElveen and, of course, Brother Wesley. Cecil McHenry continues to need our prayers and Christina very much. And we pray for Margaret and Raymond Wright. And Brother David Lydon also needs the Lord. Edna Scott and Beatrice McGarry, Patsy Doherty, and Alec Robbins and Dave Boland over in Canada. And we pray for Elizabeth McAreevy and Peter Moy and Joanne Peden. Uh, Philip Archibald, too, we continue to pray for him and his family, that God will be with them. James Gaston, we continue to pray for James. And uh, it's good to see Elaine uh, McClemens with us after surgery, and we just praise God for her return. Violet McLaughlin uh, needs the Lord. And Albert McCook, we continue to pray for Albert. And uh, Hazel, uh, Ray Laverty, Martin Moore, and Alison McClellan. We pray for Bobby Todd and... Bobby Archibald, uh, Joan Hunter, and we remember Alan, Ellen Morris, Robert Hunter, and uh, Brother David McKendry too, uh, needs the Lord, and we continue to pray for him. Philip Duke also, and we pray for Gillian's mother, and we pray for Gillian herself, that the Lord will touch and heal her ankle. Jean Montgomery needs the Lord, and we pray for Siobhan and Shirley's dad and brother, uh, that the Lord will be with them. Alex's neighbor, Marion, We've been asked to remember Linda Borland, that's Edwin Brown's sister. Uh, she has collapsed and uh, she's in the hospital quite very seriously ill. And so we do pray for Linda that God will be with her and bless her and touch her and heal her in the lovely name of our Lord Jesus. Billy Smith also needs the Lord and we remember Johnny McCurdy and Gwenny Stewart and uh, we continue to pray for Moira that the Lord will just be with her. She's having a bad old time, and we just ask God to minister to her. Stuart Boyd and Joan Logan, Ivor Patterson and Ruth McAleese, we pray for those that are bereaved, that God will be with them. And we pray for that the God will comfort them. We pray for the Sunday school, that the Lord will bless uh, the teachers and children as they go to their classes. And we do pray for the ministry of God's word, that God will bless his word, to our hearts and to our lives. In Jesus' name. Here are many, many needs, and we're going to bring them before the Lord and pray for them. But first of all, I believe that we should remember in Remembrance Day today that we should remember those that have fought in the wars previous, and indeed many, many have died, and we're going to remember them very much this morning. So let's have a, a minute's silence. Let's stand in the presence of God and just have a minute's silence before we pray. may be seated. Our gracious God and eternal Father in heaven, as we bow in thy lovely presence this Lord's Day morning and this Remembrance Sunday, our God and our Father, we thank you and we praise thee, Lord, for the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. That was the greatest sacrifice of all, the sacrifice that our Lord Jesus Christ made on Calvary's cross, and there you died a death that no man could have died, and you did it for us. Lord, we can say he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was laid on him, and with his stripes we are healed. 
Heavenly Father, we remember those, the Lord, that fought in the wars uh, gone by. And, O oh, Father, give their lives. And, Father, we just ask you, God, as we remember them this today, that, Lord, that it will speak to others of the nearness of God. And, Father, we pray indeed that think of those men that have had no opportunity, no time, Lord, to think about their soul salvation, gone into eternity. And, O oh, Father, we remember the loved ones that are left behind. And we pray, Lord, that on this Remembrance Day that it will speak to them loudly. Father, we pray for all those that are sick this morning. We lift them all up before you and we pray very much for them. And we ask you, God, that you will minister to them. Lord, you know the individual needs. And we ask you, Lord, that you will minister healing. We thank God, Father, to see our sister back in the church again, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that you will just continue to bless her. We think of Linda Borland, Lord, this morning, how ill she is. Young woman, Lord, and we ask you, God, that you will be with her. That minister unto her, Lord, this day in hospital and touch her and heal her. In the mighty name of our Lord Jesus, we ask it. Father, will you bless your word to our hearts today? <coughs> Father, open up the word of God and may the Holy Spirit of God find lodging place in every heart and every life. Father, we ask the Lord to bless the table before us this morning. And Father, grant as we partake of these emblems, we will be enriched and blessed. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, this morning we do invite you to join with us around the lovely table of remembrance. For the Lord Jesus, on the night, same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it, and said, This is my body broken for you. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death until he come.
demands my soul, my life, my own. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul. My own. Amen. We're delighted to see you all this morning, and we do give you a very warm welcome in the lovely name of our Lord Jesus. Uh, some announcements to make. Of course, the newsletter. If you haven't had this month's newsletter, it's in the foyer. So pick it up as you leave, uh, please. Also, the uh, Mount Calvary Christmas dinner. It's on Friday the 29th of uh, November this month uh, in Bushtown uh, Hotel Coleraine. It's at 7 o'clock. It's a four-course Christmas menu. Adults, £20.00 and Sunday school, children, Bible class, uh, children are all free. Please give all names and menu choices to Trevor Adams by the 24th of November. So do remember that and please um, give your names to Trevor or put them down <coughs> as soon as possible, please. That's on Friday the 29th of November in the Bushtown Hotel at 7 o'clock. If you'd like a CD of any of our services, you can have that by putting your name on the sheet at the back, and uh, we'll get you a CD. 50p box is there if you'd like to contribute to that. We appreciate uh, those that do. Looking forward to this evening at 6.30 is our evangelistic service, and I will be the speaker at the evening service. So let's pray for this evening service that God will indeed just bless abundantly in the lovely name of Jesus. I think those are all the announcements now. Uh, we're going to turn to the Word of God. Please turn with me, please, to the book of Romans again. Romans chapter 13. Book of Romans chapter 13. I want to speak this morning on the believer's spiritual duty. Romans chapter 13, and we'll commence reading at verse number 11. And that knowing the time, that now is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, nor in chambering or wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put on ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And we know that God will bless to us the reading of his precious, precious word. Having begun this chapter at the very beginning, we talked about the duty of the believer in respect of Submitting, submitting to government, and that's very important. But Paul now turns his attention to the believer's duty as we live out our daily lives. And while government uh, passes laws and uh, we, that 
are designed to protect and control society. If there was no laws, society would be in a worse mess than it is today. The Christian has a duty to live out uh, the life of Christ as he passes through this world. That is the emphasis of these verses. If you were observant as we read this, uh, as we read that text, you will notice that Paul uses the language of haste and urgency. He tells us that the duties mentioned here are not to be put off until another day. It's important that we think about them and act upon them right now, but are to be carried out every day as the believer lives his or her life in this world. Let's look at the believer's spiritual duty today. You, you, you may find, find uh, that you are doing your duty well. However, you might come to see that uh, there are certain areas that need attention. First of all, in, in verse 11, uh, it says, our duty is to watch diligently. Watch the seasons. See what's happening around us. The word time refers to a season of time. And the whole verse has to do with the return of our Lord Jesus Christ for his own people, those who are saved by the wonderful grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the idea here is that the believer is to keep his eyes on the changing world around him and understand that the coming of the Lord is near. My, when we look around this old world and, and read our newspapers and listen to the news, we realize that the Lord is coming and coming soon. Sadly, many believers uh, cruise lazily uh, through life, not even considering the fact that Jesus might return today, this moment. And yet, all one has to do is to cross-reference with the, the, the daily newspapers and the Word of God. And we can see easily that the coming of the Lord is very close. Therefore, the advice Jesus is given here in Matthew's chapter 24 is still good advice today. Paul tells us that the time for slumbering is long, long past. The word high time means a pacific hour has arrived. Too many of the people of God are sleeping on the job. Too many of us living their lives as if they, ple they, they, they please without thought about the will of God and not without thought about the coming of of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sleep is defined as a, a state of, of inactivity with a loss of consciousness and a, de, a, a degree in, in res, responsiveness to events taking place. In other words, we're out of it when we're sleeping. In other words, we're sleeping we're the sleeping person of he's out of touch with what is happening when you're sound asleep you don't know what's happening around you and there's so many people are, are spiritually sleeping today and while it may be fine to have a doze when you're watching TV or whatever or to get a good night's rest a good night's sleep. There's no excuse for being asleep regarding the things of God. No excuse whatsoever. The Bible says that. However, many people in church are in a state of inactivity when it comes to the things of God. They're not concerned about the souls that are going to hell and the people that are going down wrong roads. This should not be. 
May the Lord find us watching and waiting for the Lord for his coming. May we find uh, ourselves awake and return. We used to sing, or maybe we still sing it, when he calls me, I will answer. I'll be somewhere working for my Lord. God grant that each one of us will be, when the Lord comes, will be working for the Lord. Paul then uh, tells us that our salvation is nearer than when we believed. It's a time of crisis. Paul is telling us that the time to sleep is well gone, is well past. Now it is time to become active in the business of the Lord. It's time to be up and doing things for God. His word rem reminds us that there is an urgency to the things of God. We don't have to be in the platform. We don't, there's many things we don't have to do, but there are so many things that we are capable of doing, and that is praying for others, praying that people will come to Christ as their Savior and Lord and Master. Every day, people are dying and going to a lost sinner's hell. Every day, the forces of evil are growing stronger uh, uh, working harder and harder in the world. There's a tremendous need for believers everywhere to wake up out of their slumbering sleep and recognize the seriousness of the latest hour and to get busy serving the Lord with all of their heart and with all of their might. If you are planning to tell, <coughs> excuse me, if you are planning to tell your neighbor about the Lord Jesus Christ, the time to do it is now. If you were planning to tell the, your family about the Lord Jesus Christ, the time to do it is now. If you are going to work for the Lord, the time to do it is now. May we recognize the crisis of the hour and dedicate our, ourselves to being all that God wants us to be in these days. Another thought that is contained in, these, uh, in this verse is that the reign of darkness on the earth is growing ever nearer his destined to his destined end. Since Satan knows that his time is short, we read in Revelation chapter 12 and 12, uh, he is pulling out all the stops in this day. He's trying to destroy us. He's trying to, to come between us and the Lord. He's doing his very best because he's no, he knows his time is short. Very soon the darkness of sin that has fallen over this world will veil, the veil will lift. The glorious dawn of the, the new day will come. A day when uh, Jesus himself will rule and reign in righteousness and glory. It's a time of, also of commitment the idea of this verse is of a, a, of a man rising from sleep, throwing off his bedclothes and his nightclothes and getting himself dressed for the day. This speaks of the believer who is lying aside and, uh, or laying aside in his ways of the old life. Dressing up once and for all in the ways of a new Jesus Christ, a new life in Jesus Christ. This is an idea that is echoed several times in this epistle of Paul. God's idea of a, the, the Christian's life is one of total commitment and dedication to the Lord. And there's not very much of that. Nobody wants uh, uh, the job 
Nobody wants my job. Nobody wants to be committed. God's idea of the Christian life is one of total, total commitment and dedication. And that's what God wants. However, most Christians see the Christian life as one of compromise. They honor God over there while they honor God over there while they're doing whatever they like over here. This cannot be God's command is for our total commitment once and for all. Have you done that? Are you willing to do that? Verse 13, our duty to walk diligently. Paul calls upon the believer to exhibit the right kind of walk in his life every day. The right kind of walk. We should show a decent walk. The phrase walk honestly means to behave properly. That is, we are to live an outward life that is consistent with who we are inside. There should be there should be no pretense in our lives, none whatsoever. If we say that we are saved, we should live as though we are saved. Live as though we have a testimony. We are to be sure that our practice matches our profession. We're looked upon. We're watched. If that man is a Christian, well, haven't you heard it so often? I want nothing to do with it. Because simply this man is not living for God the way he should. Note, I am convinced that the, the reason so many people have such a hard time staying clean and also living for God is because they have never been saved in the first place. What about that? Some people and they can't live for God, then they have never moved forward. And you think to yourself, have they ever got it? Have they ever been saved? With the new birth comes a desire to live a life that is well-pleasing to, to God, a life that is honest, a life that is a living sacrifice to the glory and honor of God. Does your walk match your talk as in the day? Does it? That is, there should be nothing hidden about our lives, nothing. We should be uh, an open book to all who look on us and see us in our, the way we, we live daily. Nothing hypocritical, nothing hidden, just a life that is open, honest, and well-pleasing to God. That's the life that we should be living. That's the life that Paul is mentioning here in the scriptures. <clears throat> Does that describe the life that you are living? We should shun the devilish walk. After uh, telling us, <clears throat> or telling how we should live, Paul turns his attention uh, to how not to live. He mentions a few sins of, of the flesh that uh, were uh, no doubt prevalent, very prevalent indeed, in Paul's day. These sins are also prevalent in our day as well. Let's look at them in, for just a moment. Rioting refers to wild parties, sexual urges, and br uh, brawling, etc., all those things. Drunkenness refers to ha uh, habitable and, and unintentional intoxicating. It can also speak of alcohol and, and drug abuse. 
It is interesting to note that the New Testament usually speaks of drunkenness and, and rioting together. If we read Romans 13 and 13, strife. The word refers to a mindset that seeks its own way first and foremost without regard to the cost of others. doesn't matter about others, as long as I'm all right. It speaks of those people who are, are uh, constantly bickering and engaged in, in competitive conflict and petty disagreements. It speaks of people who are just plain mean, always looking for a fight, walking around with a, 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 an attitude and a chip on, your shoulder, on their shoulder. You've met them. The world and sadly the church is filled with that kind of people throughout the whole world. Envy refers to the spirit of jealousy. This is an attitude of me first and everyone else afterwards. Even God. Standing before God and I'm first Lord and you'll come second if I have any time left. It is an attitude of the heart that seeks everything um, self once without concerning the impact upon the lives of others. Are any of these things active in your life today, are they? If so, there is a remedy. And that remedy is called confession and repentance. Our duty is to watch diligently. Our duty is to war diligently. Our duty is to walk diligently. And in verse 14, it talks about our duty to want diligently. Paul tells us that while we are waiting in, the wor in this world for the Lord's return, we should be careful that we act the right way and that we should be representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are, that's what we are when we go out into this world. We are representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's why we're to walk and act responsibly. Responsible. He tells us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, we are pleased, uh, we are placed into Jesus Christ at the moment of our conversion. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, here he means that we are to clothe ourselves in all of Jesus. Put on the Lord continually. We are to adopt his character as our character. We are to adopt his lifestyle as our lifestyle. We, he is truth, and we are to walk in truth. He is light, and we are to walk in light. He is faithful, and we are to be faithful as well. He is holy, and we are to be holy. He loves the Father, and we are to love the Father. He, is, he walks in total obedience to God. And we are to walk in total obedience to God as well. The idea is captured by John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. The idea here is progression towards perfection. God is in the business of growing saints. God wants to see us grow. And we should see a Christian, when someone uh, accepts Christ as their Lord and Savior and Master, we should see growth in their life. If there's no growth, then there's something seriously wrong. We need to see growth. He is seeking to reproduce the life of a son in each one of us. Therefore, until he comes, let us be determined that we will live Christ-like in front of hell-bound uh, hell world that we live in. We are told to 
make not provision for the flesh. The word provision means a, a forethought or planning. The idea is this, uh, we are to avoid any and all attempts uh, by the mind to allow for the fulfillment of the flesh, fleshly lusts. Avoid all those things. We are guilty of assuming that sins be, sin begins with the devil, aren't we? We blame the devil for everything that, we, that happens. He thinks it up and we're tempted by it. Well, occur, occasionally that does happen. But more often sin begins closer to home. The, as long as we live in this world, there will be within us a pull towards the things of the, law, of the world. Always. As long as we're in these old bodies, there will be a pull towards the things of the world. However, we do not have to fall into that trap, do we? We do not have to fall into uh, any temptation. Corinthians 10 and verse 31 tells us that. We will sin, but we do not have to. We will be tempted but we do not have to yield. When we allow our minds, hearts, wills, and emotions to rule over our lives, we're in trouble. They will make a provision for the flesh because they are still um, heavily influenced by the flesh and by wicked desires as long as we live in this old body. However, when we allow spirit, the Spirit of God to take control of our thinking and of our lives, we will not do what the flesh wants, but we will do what the Spirit wants. And that's the position that we should be in. Not to think of, of all the, 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 the old things of the world and the things that we could be caught up with, but let's bring our minds into subjection and think about the things that will benefit and bless the Lord. The whole idea here is that we are to control the mind, heart, will, and emotion so that we are under the power of the Holy Spirit continually. We are to give no thought uh, to the desires of the flesh. Sound taught, but the Spirit of God is able to give us the victory in this warfare that we're living in. So Christian, are you doing the spiritual duty? Are you doing your spiritual duty right now? Or has the Spirit of God placed his finger on some area or other that needs immediate attention in your life, in my life? If so, then I recommend you to bring that need before the Lord Jesus Christ if he's calling you to come. Maybe you've never been saved. Maybe you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord and Master. You're still on the broad and crowded way to leads to destruction, which is a dangerous road. This passage tells us we are to watch. Watch what's happening in the world and line it up with Scripture and we will realize that the Lord Jesus is coming and he's coming soon. I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to miss that lovely coming. I don't want you to miss being caught up to meet the Lord in the air. I want you to be saved. I'd love you to be saved. And I pray that you will come and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, and Lord and Master before it's too late. Shall we pray? <clears throat> our God and our Father, we bow before thee again in the lovely name of Jesus. And, O oh, Father, we thank you again for the precious word of God. We thank you for the Bible that leads us and guides us. And, Father, we know that we don't read it often enough and we don't apply it to our lives enough. So, our Father, we just pray indeed that you will 
Teach us your ways so that we may walk in your paths, so that we may be ever guided and directed by the Holy Spirit of God. Lord, our cry is, Lord, teach us, teach us the things of God. Father, we thank you and we praise thee, Lord, for Paul's instruction to us in this lovely book of Romans. And we ask you, Lord, that it will not be in vain, but, O oh God, that we, each one of us will apply those things to our lives and to our hearts, and that we may see a difference. People may see a difference. And, Lord, you too will see a difference in our lives. Father, we look forward to this evening's service. We ask you, Lord, that you'll come down again in the midst of us in a mighty way. And, Father, stir our hearts up in the meantime. Help us to pray. Not only pray, Lord, but come out to the God's house and to hear the word of God again. We just commit everyone into your loving care now, Father. For Christ's sake we ask it. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to sing a closing hymn together. To Calvary, Lord, in spirit now, our weary souls repair to dwell upon the dying love. It tastes of sweetness there. We're going to stand as we sing. <clears throat> bless you.